Hello and welcome to All Things Apostolic. Today we are continuing our discussion on leadership development. We are going to specifically look at the way in which Jesus uh, developed his followers with an intentional process. Today we're going to explore leadership through the lens of Jesus Christ, the greatest leader who's ever lived. In this episode, we're going to examine the nuanced and intentional approach that Jesus employed uh, to develop his disciples. The Gospels present us with a remarkable narrative showing that Jesus didn't just randomly choose his followers. Rather, he selected them through a deliberate process that unfolded in stages. While there is a common misconception regarding the selection of the Twelve, that is, that many readers of Scripture mistakenly view the accounts of Jesus' calling of his disciples in John and in Luke as if they're contradictory, uh, these passages don't contradict one another. Instead, they describe different phases in the apostles' calling. This illustrates the meticulous approach that Jesus took. You see, the first call was uh, fundamentally a call to conversion. It laid the foundation um, principle that genuine leadership in the Christian realm is inherently rooted in one's transformative encounter with Jesus Christ. This conversion, this personal encounter with Jesus, sets the stage for a deeper journey into leadership. As we unpack this journey, we find that Jesus' strategy was layered, creating uh, concentric circles of influence and intimacy around him. He spoke to the multitudes. He shared deep truths with the 70. He entrusted the 12 with more significant responsibility, and he revealed himself mostly to his innermost circle. In today's discussion, we're going to look at these layers and examine how each successive group experienced a closer leadership or a closer relationship, rather, with Jesus. And so in the ministry of Jesus, we observe the creation of various layers of followers, each with distinct roles and degrees of closeness to him. This layered approach wasn't something that was arbitrary. Instead, it was a strategy that allowed Jesus to maximize his impact and tailor his teachings to suit different audiences. At the broadest level, we have the multitudes. These were the large crowds that followed Jesus. They were drawn to his teachings and his miracles. They received his parables and public teaching, which were often designed to provoke thought and stir the heart, yet they remained at the periphery of his innermost circle. And so within this larger group, Jesus identified a more dedicated set of followers, referred to as the Seventy. This specific group mentioned in Luke's gospel was given a unique mission to extend the reach of Jesus' ministry across the region. The number 70 carries with it symbolic weight. Uh, it echoes the 70 nations of Genesis and the 70 elders that were appointed by Moses, suggesting a universal scope to Jesus' ministry. These followers were entrusted with the message of the kingdom of God and performed mighty works, mirroring the apostolic activities of the Twelve, but on a broader scale. The commissioning of the Seventy also highlights an important aspect of Jesus' leadership, and that is the empowerment and trust that he placed in his followers. By sending them out, he demonstrated confidence in their ability to convey his message and enact the kingdom's values, which prepared them for the ground of continued ministry. Then, closer to Jesus, we see the twelve disciples, uh, a group that was selected for more intense companionship and instruction. Their training was rigorous, it was more relational. And it involved not just the public teaching, but it also included the private explanations, some correction, and revelations of deeper truths. This inner group journeyed with Jesus, shared in his daily life, and they were privy to the nuances of his mission in ways that the larger groups weren't um, privy. Uh, through this tiered approach, Jesus exemplified 
um, a leadership principle, and that is the importance of investing in a core group who in turn can influence others, creating a ripple effect that extends far beyond the immediate circle of leadership. And so when we take a little bit le- uh, uh, a little bit deeper focus um, inside the multitude and uh, at the 70, we realize that the 70 uh, represent a critical layer between the multitudes and the 12. Uh, the group's inception and mission is detailed in the Gospel of Luke, and it provides us with a glimpse into Jesus' strategic approach to ministry and leadership development. Luke 10 uh, gives us the account of Jesus appointing the 70, sending them out in pairs to every town and place where he himself was about to go. This strategic deployment was not merely about preaching. It was also an act of preparation, which would lay the groundwork for Jesus' arrival in these areas. The number 70, as we already noted earlier, is significant in echoing the nations and the 70 elders uh, appointed by Moses. And the reason this is important is because, again, it signifies a universal mission and an extension of God's governance through his people. The instructions given to the 70 mirror those given to the 12, emphasizing the proclamation of the kingdom of God and the performance of healing and miraculous signs. So this parallel underscores a key aspect of Jesus' leadership philosophy, and that is the replication of authority and empowerment across different levels of followers to ensure a consistent message. The 70 were distinct from the 12, These individuals were given a specific task and specific authority uh, and separate from the ongoing immediate development of the Twelve. Yet it was still crucial to the broader miracle or mission of Jesus' life. They were to act as forerunners preparing towns and hearts for the transformative teaching and healing ministry of Jesus Christ. The mission of the 70 also illustrates another essential leadership principle, and that is the need for scalability and delegation. By empowering the 70, Jesus demonstrated trust in their ability to extend his ministry beyond the physical limitations of his uh, human presence. This act of delegation was not just practical, it was deeply relational, signifying a transfer of trust and authority that empowered the 70 to act as legitimate representatives of Jesus and his kingdom. Now, when we look at the 12 disciples, they stand at the core of Jesus' leadership model. They represent a significant level of trust, instruction, and relationship. Unlike the broader groups that Jesus taught, the 12 were chosen for an intimate journey with him, marked by direct teaching, personal mentorship, and the sharing of life's daily rhythms. The selection of these 12 men was a deliberate act as narrated in the Gospels where Jesus calls them to a closer relationship. This group's formation is significant and it highlights a transition from casual followership to dedicated discipleship. They were not just students, nor were they merely observers. They were active participants in Jesus' ministry, and they were chosen to carry forward the mantle of his work. The relationship of this group with Jesus is evident in the gospel narratives. These 12 were privy to private teachings, uh, explanations of the parables, and insights into the mysteries of the kingdom of God that were not disclosed to the general public. This inner circle was also witnesses to Jesus' most profound miracles, moments of divine glory, and intense personal trials. And these were evidently experiences that forged their understanding and character in unique ways. In Mark chapter 3, the 12 disciples are named, and here there is a sense of personal calling and destiny being assigned. This emphasizes the significance of the wording used in the gospel. It's likened unto the calling of the disciples as an act of creation. In other words, they were not just appointed, but they were made into something by Jesus. 
The linguistic choice that is used here in this gospel draws a parallel with the creation narrative, suggesting a transformative process that the disciples underwent, being shaped and formed for their future roles. Their training was comprehensive. It encompassed not only theological and spiritual dimensions, but also practical lessons in leadership and the dynamics of faith in action. Jesus' method of teaching the Twelve involved a blend of instruction, modeling, correction, and empowerment to prepare them for the eventual task of leading the early church. Now, within the Twelve, there is a noticeable group that also emerges, and that is um, Peter, James, and John, his innermost circle. Within this group of the Twelve, there was an even more intimate circle uh, consisting of these three men. These three men enjoyed a special proximity to Jesus, being witnesses to the most private and significant moments of his ministry. Their experiences with Jesus provide deep insights into the nature of close mentorship and the levels of trust and responsibility in leadership development. Peter, James, and John were present at some of the most pivotal events in Jesus' life and ministry. They were the only ones that were able to witness the raising of Jairus' daughter. Um, they also were the only ones to witness the transfiguration on the Mount Tabor, um, in which they saw his divine glory uh, conveying, uh, or conversing rather, with Moses and Elijah. It was an experience that revealed the heavenly endorsement of Jesus' mission and his fulfillment of the law and the prophets. This event, again, was only witnessed by these three. Also, in the Garden of Gethsemane, during Jesus' most vulnerable moment, he chose these three to be there with him, and it exposed them to a profound agony and the earnestness of his prayer before his arrest. This experience showed the depth of Jesus' trust in them, sharing his moments of his most intense personal trial and divine submission. In the garden, <clears throat> it was only Peter, James, and John. The distinction of these three within the Twelve uh, underscores a key aspect of Jesus' leadership strategy, and that is the investment in and development of a core group capable of carrying forward his mission with insight and fidelity. Their unique experiences with Jesus equip them with an understanding and perspective that was crucial for the leadership roles they would assume in the early church. And so through the special relationship Jesus had with these three men, we see the importance of close mentorship, the sharing of trials and triumphs, and the preparation of leaders who are deeply aligned with the leader's vision and mission. Their journey with Jesus exemplifies how leaders can cultivate trust, share their experiences, and prepare a select few for significant future responsibilities. And so one of the things that we see throughout all of these is that Jesus was a relational leader. He exemplified what it means to be a relational leader that is invested in the lives and development of his followers. Throughout his ministry, he demonstrated that effective leadership transcends mere instruction and extends into genuine relationship building that is characterized by empathy, by an openness with those whom you're leading, and sharing in a journey. The Gospel of John introduces us to a God who became flesh and dwelt among us, showcasing the ultimate act of relationship and relational leadership. The incarnation was God's supreme self-expression, and it bridged the divine and human realms to establish a direct personal connection with humanity. Jesus' ministry was marked by this desire for closeness as he invited his disciples to share in his daily life experiences teaching not just as abstract principles, but as a lived reality. And so Jesus' interactions with his disciples reflect a leadership style that prioritizes accessibility. Uh, 
He broke down the barriers that often separate leaders from followers, choosing instead to engage his disciples in a manner that was both personal and transformative. Whether dining with them, journeying with them, or engaging in deep discussion, Jesus used every opportunity to foster a sense of belonging and understanding. His approach uh, contrasted starkly uh, the religious leaders of his time who often maintained a distance from those whom they deemed unworthy. Jesus, however, embraced all, extending his fellowship and fellowship to tax collectors, to sinners, and to the marginalized. Furthermore, Jesus emphasized the importance of vertical relationships, that with the Father. His teaching in Matthew's house where he dined with tax collectors and sinners was not just a societal gathering, but a demonstration of his mission to reconcile humanity with God. Through these interactions, Jesus modeled a leadership that balanced divine authority with relationships, showcasing that true leadership is not about maintaining a lofty distance, but about engaging authentically with others. His leadership style in terms of relationship was also evident in his patience, in his enduring love for the disciples despite their many flaws and failures. From Peter's impulsiveness to Thomas's doubt and the rest of the disciples' fear and betrayal during his crucifixion, Jesus continued to love, to teach, and to guide them. He demonstrated that leadership involves a steadfast commitment to growth and well-being of others, even in the face of challenges and in the face of disappointment. But one of the things that was probably very characteristic, would be a good way of saying it, of Jesus' ministry, was this um, leading through releasing. Uh, leading through releasing was central to Jesus' strategy for ensuring the sustainability and expansion of his mission. Jesus' method of developing leaders was cyclical, beginning with selection, moving through deep relational engagement, and culminating in the act of sending them out to minister. This cycle is evident in the way he prepared the Twelve, providing them with not just theoretical teaching, but practical, hands-on experience in ministry. In Luke 9, we see a clear example of this approach. Jesus called his twelve disciples together, gave them power and authority over all demons, and then he sent them out to preach the kingdom of God and heal the sick. This action was more than a mere delegation of tasks. It was an intentional release of authority and empowerment, allowing the disciples to apply what they had learned in a real-world setting. We see Jesus do the same thing in Luke 10 with the 70. And so this strategy of leading through releasing is essential also for contemporary leaders as well. It underscores the importance of trust and potentials, the potentiality of others, the necessity of practical experience in leadership development, and the role of mentorship in guiding and refining the skills of an emerging leader. And the reason why Jesus consistently developed leaders and continued to set them up for what lied ahead was because Jesus understood the importance of succession. The true mark of Jesus' leadership is epitomized in his succession plan, ensuring that continuity and expansion of his ministry would continue beyond his earthly life. He was aware that the sustainability of his mission depended on the preparedness and empowerment of the disciples to carry his work forward. And so central to this succession plan was the promise and delivery of the empowerment through the Holy Spirit. Jesus discusses in John 4 and 12 are particularly telling. He assures his disciples that they would not only continue his work, but they would do greater things. This was a statement of trust and expectation, signifying uh, the potential that he saw in his followers and the expansive vision that he had for their ministry and for their future. In John 12, Jesus says, As the Father has sent me, even so I send you. And then he breathes on them, saying, Receive ye the Holy Spirit. 
This serves as a powerful moment of commissioning and empowerment. This act was not just symbolic, but it was a precursor to Pentecost, where the disciples would receive the fullness of the Holy Spirit's power to equip them for the global mission that lied ahead of them. John 20 and 22 also anticipates Pentecost and underscores the strategic nature of Jesus' plan. He was setting the stage for a significant empowerment that would enable the disciples to break beyond their previous limitations and engage in ministry with divine authority and power. The succession strategy was not merely about past delegation. It was about ensuring that the disciples were spiritually and practically equipped to advance the kingdom. The outpouring of the Spirit on the day of Pentecost was the culmination of Jesus' mentorship and preparation, a divine endorsement of their readiness to lead and expand the church. And so succession in Jesus' leadership model was about creating a legacy of empowered leaders who could replicate his ministry impact across different contexts and across different generations. The effectiveness of his plan is evident in the rapid growth of the early church, the boldness of the apostles' preaching, and the transformative social and in spiritual impact of their ministries. And so in reflecting on Jesus' leadership, we find that his approach was comprehensive, extending from personal selection and relational development to strategic empowerment and succession planning. His model provides a blueprint for leaders that is not only effective in its immediate context, but also in our current context, and it is replicatable across all time and cultures. And so, as we continue our discussion in leadership development, it's important to step back and look at the methods of Jesus in how he prepared his disciples for what laid ahead. Thank you for joining me this week on All Things Apostolic. I look forward to seeing you next week.